Drinks, food, art, fun. This is Hops and Spirits Kentucky. Welcome into another Hops and Spirits Kentucky podcast. If I sound stuffy, it's uh, because I am Mother Nature and it's uh, ever-changing temperatures and weather this week has gotten the best of me. But I shall persevere because we've got a great episode for you this week as we talk with Old Foresters and Melissa Rift uh, to talk about her role as Master Taster there, which she took over in November. But before that, what's pouring Kentucky? Some news and notes from around the state. Downtown Lexington Partnership announced that Thursday Night Live will return to Tandy Park on Thursday, April 6th, and the opener is 1985, which was chosen via a fan vote. You can see the full lineup at downtownlex.com. The Urban Bourbon Trail has added new Louisville locations to its roster, including Chill Bar Highlands, Four Peg Smokehouse and Bar, and Matt Wynn's Steakhouse. The Urban Bourbon Trail highlights some of the city's best local bourbon bars and restaurants through a free digital passport complete with discounts such as BOGO Abset its stops. Lexington is home to the best locally owned restaurant in Kentucky, according to Southern Living. Ramsey's Diner, which has multiple locations across town, takes home that honor. As it's known for its cozy atmosphere, rotating Missy's Pie of the Month, and of course, Hot Browns. Congratulations to mixologist M. Sego of North of Bourbon in Louisville, who recently won the Rose Julep Cocktail Competition in the Judge's Choice category with a spin on the mint julep featuring rose petal steeped bourbon. The People's Choice Award went to Colleen McCarthy Clark of Martini Italian Bistro in Louisville, who mixed up a Japanese themed julep. The competition featured eight different mixologists from across the state. Blue Run Spirits showed off the first look of its upcoming distillery campus in Georgetown. The 35,000-square-foot distillery and a 20,000-square-foot rickhouse will break ground sometime this year at Lane's Run Business Park with a projected opening in 2025. The design, called Meander, is meant to evoke the journey of a limestone-rich water of the Royal Spring in Georgetown as it winds its way through the distilling, age, and blending process to become Blue Run's bourbons and rye whiskeys. The Royal Spring, dubbed the Blue Run by one of Blue Run's founders serves as the company's namesake. You can check out the photo and get a little more information on our website at hopspirits.com. You can also check out our past episode with Shaylin Gammon, their whiskey director there as well, as that was a really fun chat. Up next, though, is our Q&A with Old Forester's Master Taster, Melissa Rift. Enjoy. Remember to check out Hops and Spirits on social media at Hop Spirits, all one word, on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, and Twitter. You can also find Hops and Spirits on YouTube and at hopspirits.com. Joining us here for our Q&A this week, she is relatively new to, to the company that she's going to be talking about. She is now Old Forester's Master Taster. Please welcome in Melissa Rift. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Well, I appreciate you joining us and we'll be talking about kind of all the fun stuff that you do for Old Forester and kind of your career journey to get to Old Forester here in a second. But I always like to to ask this and, you know, the Cliff Notes version. And when I say Cliff Notes, just a little bit, because like I said, we'll, we'll be asking some fun questions. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, so uh, I'll start with kind of outside of work since we're going to be talking a lot about work, but um, I'm a local Louisvillian. I was born and most of my childhood uh, raised here in Louisville, Kentucky, so definitely has a a special place in my heart. Um, I moved to Dallas in middle school, so kind of had an interesting time, uh, middle school and high school, got a great education there. I eventually found my way back to Kentucky for grad school, so I kind of moved around for a bit, but really rediscovered the city uh, of Louisville and really got into the bourbon trail um, kind of while I was in grad school, getting my master's degree, and uh, currently live here with my wife of two years. We have four pets, two dogs and two cats, but things are very chill and fun at our house. Um, and, uh, we live in the South end of Louisville. We love to go hiking on the weekends, live music, uh, you know, just, uh, be about town as much as we can. Now, now I gotta ask, since you've got the four pets, are they bourbon names or did you go completely away from that world? <laughs> no, I think, um, I always keep bourbon out of the, uh, the household pet names. Um, but I love folks who have, you know, I've met rise and bourbons and, dogs named after people's favorite brands. And I think that's so cute, but no, ours are kind of eclectic. We've got Ruby and Tucker, our dogs and uh, Scout and Missy Elliott, our cats actually. So we've just got some random ones. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Now, obviously you enjoy bourbon, uh, you, you know, clearly you're in the industry. Um, how did you get into this crazy world that is the bourbon world? 
So I was studying uh, social work actually at University of Louisville. Like I said, I kind of rediscovered the city. I came back. My family didn't live here anymore. Um, and I was a little bit of a whiskey drinker towards my end of college years, you know, of drinking age and uh, got into the whiskey scene as it was just kind of budding. Um, but by the time I settled in Louisville, the, the bourbon trail was really gaining momentum. So I started going on all the tours and collecting all these stories and factoids that I learned on the tours. I also kind of noticed that some of the information from tour to tour was a little inconsistent. So that drove me to start researching like the accuracy of the information and that just opened up a whole world for me. So I actually took a tour that was really history focused and it compelled me to apply. And my intention, because I was a practicing family therapist at the time, was to just do my day job and give tours maybe on the weekends. But it just snowballed into kind of a bigger career opportunity pretty quickly. Um, and, and here we are today, six years later. So. It's all history. <laughs> I, I was going to say, I mean, did you when you became that tour guy, did you ever think that it would launch you on the path to where you are now? No. In fact, for like about six to eight months, I think I was like a little bit delusional. And I kept saying, I'm just going to take a year off of being a therapist so that I don't burn out and I'll give tours for a year and then I'll jump back into it. And I wasn't expecting it to kind of like suck me in the way that it did. Um, and I found that I could use a lot of my skills from therapy to be good at what I was doing in hospitality. Um, and that was when I really just started taking it into more of a career path. And by the time I was working on single barrel programs, I knew that I wanted to stay here. Well, I was gonna gonna say, I mean, you've been that single barrel program manager, you've been in in leadership ship roles as as well along the way. Has it kind of been nice to kind of see that whole side of the the industry in a sense, um, you know, whether from tour guide to single barrel to now master taster? Because I'm guessing that has probably helped you um, kind of see things a little different, maybe. Absolutely. I always kind of talk about my background as a therapist and that I, I worked mostly in family therapy, which is all about family systems and kind of integrating those systems in a healthier way. It's a lot about communication. So the cross functionality of working in single barrel where you're kind of bridging this supply and demand world um, with these brands, it lent itself really well to the kind of systems background that I had. Um, I've always been a very collaborative worker. And so starting in hospitality, I think was great because I really got an acute sense of the brand home and how we tell the brand stories at these visitor experiences that have become a huge part of the industry. Um, and then getting into single barrels was able to really get into the production side kind of on the back end. And so I'm still learning a lot about that supply and production side because I haven't quite got the access that I'm afforded now, which is why this is so exciting. Um, but it really worked for me to start in hospitality because that's where I had some talent. And now I've been able to really use that cross functionality to kind of bridge those gaps and act as a liaison between between those worlds that people usually sit in either or, you know. Well, and like we said, now you're at Old Forester. You're their their master taster. What drew you to to Old Forester? I've always been a big Old Forester fan. You know, being from Louisville and really kind of coming up with my bourbon education here, um, Old Forester's always been a bit of a hometown hero for us. So if you go out, go out to the bars, you know, anybody who's from Louisville will probably be ordering like an Old Foe on the Rocks or Old Forester and they're old fashioned. Um, so it was just a real part of my kind of upbringing and bourbon here in the city. Um, but I've really gotten to appreciate, especially with my onboarding in this role, but even before I got here, uh, the culture at Brown Foreman has always been so highly spoken of. So I was really interested in working for any of their brands and out of them, Old Forester kind of aligned with my ethos the most. You know, it's a very fun brand. It's got so much rich history, which is what drew me to the industry originally. Um, but the brand has really been able to kind of capture this modern relevance as of late, and it's got a ton of momentum nationally. So I think it was just a brand that I always felt very emotionally connected to. I felt like it understood me and I understood it. Um, and so it's just a pleasure to get to work on it now. Well, and, and, and part of your role is kind of being a brand ambassador of sorts and being able to talk about that, go go out and, and so forth. And what's it like to do that type of role um, for a brand like this? 
It's so fun. I was actually trying to break into ambassador work for a little while. And some of that was thwarted by COVID because right as I was getting kind of travel opportunities to get out in front of people, a lot of our travel was shut down. So, you know, it's something everybody was dealing with at the time and it's made it even better to get to do it now because everyone's coming out again and we're doing in, in person tastings again. Um, so it's just amazing because I take, you know, as part of my responsibility as master taster, I take it very seriously to translate both what we're doing on the brand out to our consumers, because we do have consumers and loyalists that are so connected to our brand. So I want them to feel like they have a line of communication through me and then vice versa. I want to kind of capture what I'm learning out in market and bring it back to the drawing table. So when we are working on these special releases and kind of the future vision of the brand that we are listening to our consumer base as far as what they're excited about and what we can do more of. Yeah, because it always seems like things are changing <laughs> uh, ra rather quickly in the world, and that's not exactly. It's hard to keep up. Works. Yeah, <laughs> and, I started picking up like you tons of podcasts, magazines, whiskey news sites, just so I can kind of keep up with these like ever changing trends. Because the industry is, uh, yeah, it's fast paced, and we work in a slow paced uh, spirit. So <laughs> yeah, I was going to say contradictory, there. right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Now, now you mentioned you're also the master taster. So what I'm guessing clearly you probably taste some bourbon on a, on a daily basis. From time basis. to time, yeah. So can you explain <laughs> kind of what that role is there at Old Forester? Yeah, so it's funny because the ambassador role I slid right into, you know, I started in November. So I've been here about four months in total. Um, and I was really ready to hit the ground running as a national brand ambassador. The master taster role is something that I'm very much... Uh, I have a bit of a learning curve too. And that's what's really exciting about this role is that I feel like I'm both um, excelling at what I do, but also getting like a top-notch education at the best supplier possible under Chris Morris and Elizabeth McCall, two of the best people you could ever learn from. Um, so eventually what it means is that I'm going to get to really be a collaborator in the future vision of the product, especially with our special releases, the 117 series, President's Choice, Birthday Bourbon, things like that. Um, and I get to be really rooted here at our home place as well, which is where I'm working out of today. Um, to really kind of connect the liquid that we're making on this site to the rest of our brand. So just really exciting things, but I'm always quick to say, while my title's master taster, you know, I'm in training. So I think the first six months to a year is just going to be a crazy huge learning experience for me. Um, and then I'm really going to get to find my stride once I have those credentials and a little bit of training under my belt. Well, and, and you talked about kind of growing up with, with the brand and especially being from Louisville and, and living there, you know, now, can you explain that history uh, behind Old Forester? Because it's been, the, the name has been around for a long, long time. Yep, over, over 150 years. So that's what's so fun about our brand is we have a lot of history that we can kind of call back to and uninterrupted history. So, you know, we were founded in 1870 um, and we're the only brand that's been in continuous production that you could find any year from the very founding of our brand up until modern day uh, without interruption under the same company name. So our archives are so rich with history. Uh, our stories are so rich with history. And so it's just really fun to kind of reach back and talk about why we were founded. We were founded on this idea of uh, guaranteed quality and authenticity with the first bottled bourbon. Um, we've always been kind of disruptors and innovators, and we have so many first to markets with the first bottled bourbon, the first single barrel with the president's choice, first holiday decanter series, you know, just so many things that we can talk about that were really like leading the industry forward. And so I think we continue to do that, um, which is an incredible thing. Our Whiskey Row series being kind of our new craft presentation of Old Forester has just done huge things for our momentum in the country. And um, I think that it's so beautiful that we get to have that kind of relevant modern day expression, but they're all named after benchmarks in our history. So just being able to connect that kind of history and what we're doing today is I think what makes us special. Well, and for you to to come into a brand that has so much history, what's that like? And then to try to put your touch on it as you kind of move forward in your role, because there is still a balancing act because people still expect a certain thing with Old Forester. But there are also, like you said, so many people looking for new things or innovative things as well. Most definitely. Yeah, that's always a conversation we're like constantly having around here. And history has always been a passion of mine. So it's really easy for me to kind of I've spent a lot of time with 
the folks in our archives and I'm still just digging into so much of the, the history and the materials that we have kind of at our fingertips. And the cool thing is, I think that there's a way because we've been innovators from the very beginning and over such a long period of time, we have so much material to work with to be able to parallel these modern trends with things that, you know, Old Forester was doing in the past. Great example of that is our 1910, our double barrel expression. You know, that is a very modern trend, the finishing trend, double barreling, things like that, really led by Old Forester and Woodford. But you go all the way back to 1910, and that was something that was happening. So I think that's a perfect example of kind of how we connect those two. And I'm excited to kind of put my own spin on things by just opening up more and more people to that history, that storytelling, and also what we're doing today. I'm on a kind of a crusade to get people to take a little pressure off themselves when it comes to whiskey. You know, it's fun. It's a fun mm -hmm. spirit to be involved in. I mean, I think a lot of people for a long time felt like they had to be able to pick out specific tasting notes and they had to drink it a certain way. And I know we've been spending years as an industry kind of breaking down those barriers, but I just like creating a safe and comfortable environment for people to learn about whiskey and enjoy whiskey and really get into Old Forester. Now there's, there's no wrong way to drink it, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Any way you like it. And people always challenge me on that. They're like, well, what if I put it with Diet Coke? And I'm like, great. <laughs> And I'm always like, you're never going to say anything that I'm going to put you down for, because if that's what you like, that's what you like. <laughs> uh, I love that. And, you know, like you said, you you get to go out, you get to talk to, to folks. What's kind of your favorite part of or parts of that? Because, you know, clearly that's kind of your background for, from before the industry is being able to talk to folks. So uh, what is your favorite part about getting out? I love just the casual conversations. You know, I do a lot of presenting in front of folks and I always tell them, I do not want to stand here and talk at you guys for 30 minutes to an hour. Like I want to engage with you. I want to hear what the flavor notes you're pulling from these products are, but I also want to hear about your experiences. You know, I'm telling stories about our brand. I love to hear other people's stories and what connects them to the spirit and why they love Old Forester as much as they do. So just really making those connections. I feel like I've made friends in every state of the U.S. doing jobs like this. Um, so it really just expands your network. And when you're in, as extroverted as I am, I don't know if you can tell, um, I have a, a large extroversion <laughs> quality to me. It's just, it you, you know, kind of fuels me to get out there and meet people, get to talk to them. Well, it's a good thing to be an extrovert doing what you do, though. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no. It's a definitely top of my resume. I think the Myers-Briggs, I scored like a 99% extroverted. So it works out well that I talk to people for a living. <laughs> well, and, and like today, I appreciate what, what you're, you're share, sharing with us. And, you know, you, you talked about some of the other people there that you get to learn from and work under with with Chris Morris, who's kind of the uh, distiller, emeritus distiller now. And then Elizabeth McCall, who's taken over that role. Uh, for for some of those brands uh, for Brown Form. And what's it like to have folks like that, that you can, if you got questions and, and like you said, you're kind of in training, learn from. It's been really incredible. Um, Elizabeth has been a huge mentor of mine since before I was in the role. Um, I was lucky enough to get connected to her through Chris Pointer, actually, um, who we spoke with at the beginning of our call. And um, she's just been a great motivator for me. She's such an incredible role model in the industry, but she also is very casual, relaxed. She also kind of has this philosophy of getting people to kind of take some pressure off themselves. So that's always made me feel good about someone who takes that approach to my role. And I feel like um, I can really kind of excel under her, her tutelage. Um, and then Chris is just an encyclopedia, you know, floating around all of us mere mortals. Um, the amount of things he holds in his brain, I just, I call it sponge mode when I'm around the two of them. Uh, and sometimes, you know, we'll be talking about real concrete, you know, kind of training goals. And sometimes he'll just kind of wax poetic about something that he saw in the archives one time. And I just try to bank all those stories and all that information as much as I can, um, because I think it's a, it's a real privilege to get to train under someone who's had such an impact on the industry. Well, and now I've, I've got to also ask, you know, in addition to kind of all that fun stuff that goes on, you know, Old Forester debuted uh, what I find fun, the sleep easy there at uh, <laughs> right off their, their campus there on Whiskey Row. And included in that is a, a meet and greet with you. Um, did, what's it like to have folks wanting to do meet and greets with you and be kind of part of that little culture of things where you get to have that one on one or that small group talk? 
Yeah, it's been really fun. The Sleep Easy has been an awesome concept to execute and people have gotten really into it. We've even had a handful of local guests just book staycations there. So it's pretty great to see people so enthusiastic about it. I've been having a wonderful time with the groups. Um, everybody who comes in after they check in to the Airbnb or the VRBO that we've got there, um, we go out for an appetizer and a round of drinks um, at one of the spots on Whiskey Row. So it gives us a good opportunity to kind of bridge with a lot of our partners here on Main Street. Uh, and it's just been fun because we always talk about, you know, there are real old forester enthusiasts out there. And our goal is always to be getting our products into the hands of people who are really excited to share it, consume it um, responsibly, of course. But it's just really nice to get to speak to some of those people and put a face and a story to them because it just continues to, you know, I think it's a real testament to the fact that we have a brand that people really do get very emotionally connected to. And we build those relationships really well. So the speakeasy has been kind of like an embodiment of that. And then you you (laughs) touched upon whether it's Chris that talks about it. Uh, from his knowledge going into the archives where you've actually got the archives there for old forester to look back on do you just find yourself sitting there on occasion just wanting to learn as much as you can yes absolutely um i was working on a project recently where i was diving into some origin stories about the mint julep since we're the the official bourbon in the mint julep for you know upcoming derby season which started like two months ago for us Um, and I think I was in the archives for like three or four hours. Um, and I probably looked through 12 to 15 cocktail books with old Forster mint juleps in them with little blurbs about how to host your party and how to bet on a horse race, you know, and that's the kind of stuff that like, I was looking at stuff from like the 1940s, uh, drinking mint juleps for the Kentucky Derby. So, um, it's just an incredible thing to get to have all of those resources at your fingertips. And one of the reasons I was so excited to work for a Brown Foreman brand, because they just do a great job preserving a lot of that history. I was going to say, is there, is there <laughs> any fun thing that you found in your, your journeys through those archives that you were just like, I never would have thought of that. <laughs> I did hear a wild story from, from Chris Morris, actually. So it wasn't necessarily in the archives, although the archives have some funny stuff in them. Um, just goofy stuff from, you know, mid 1900s. Uh, But Chris told me one time about this story, you know, the Mattingly distillery was a distillery that Brown Foreman purchased to start producing Old Forester after the Bottled and Bond Act. And it burned down, I think, early 1920s. um, And they needed to get their yeast strain back as repeal was kind of imminent. And so they found the master distiller at the time, I think he was working at a grocery store or something. Sad place for a master distiller, but this is Prohibition era. And um, they took a bunch of mash out to the Mattingly, Mattingly Distillery and they caught yeast strains that were floating around the site and isolated the flavors in them and, and isolated that proprietary yeast for Old Forester. So when I heard him, I heard him tell that story on a tour and I was trying to play it cool, like I knew it, but in the back, I was like, that is the wildest story I've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> so little things like that sometimes that he just casually kind of spouts off they like blow my mind <laughs> uh, it's it's a great place to be and it's such a cool spot and you know at the at the end of the day people are always curious about what's maybe coming next for y'all so without getting yourself in trouble because i don't i don't want anything like that to happen but what can you <laughs> tell us is coming down the down the works for for old forester and, and maybe some releases that we can look forward to yeah well you know we always got something cooking up um far in advance. So uh, obviously we got a lot going on at the distillery. If you ever follow any of our special releases, most of them route out of our visitor center on Whiskey Row. Um, So you can always expect uh, a 117 series in the pipeline. We drop usually, I think, two to three year of those. Um, Same with the President's Choice. Uh, We usually have a couple releases of that throughout the year. Of course, September seems like a long way away, but it'll be here in a flash. And that's when we've got our birthday ribbon coming. So a lot of those kind of standard premium uh, special offerings that we we do out of the Whiskey Row site here at Old Forester. Um, Always keep your eyes on that. And then, you know, We've been seeing tons of momentum with our craft line. Of course, our our core products, the 86, 100 proof, the rye, just doing phenomenally. So I don't know. Keep your eyes peeled. You might find something. <laughs> I like it. A little little tease, a little tease. And then yeah. <laughs> uh, I guess my final question for you is, is kind of, you know, what's what's next uh, for you and what are you hoping to, to do there at All Forester? 
Right now, I am, uh, like I said, soaking in just as much as I can, kind of learning who all the stakeholders are in my like very broad world of being both an ambassador and the master taster. Um, I'm really excited to kind of get my hands into some of these uh, special offerings in, in the years to come. Like I said, they they come down a pipeline that's pretty long. So um, we've got great things that are already kind of in the works, uh, but as new ones come and it's time for us to kind of ideate on uh, experimental small batch stuff, especially for 117 series, I'm really excited to kind of learn the whole innovation process because I've never actually been involved uh, from beginning to end in, in an innovation project. So I think that that's going to be a big step for me. And then outside of that, just continuing to get out there and drive awareness and growth for Old Forester across the country. And, and hopefully, uh, and I think we will see that great success to that. So hoping that it uh, you know, continues to grow and takes us even further. Well, it's a, a rich history to build upon. And and uh, Melissa, I, I really appreciate your time and, and sharing your story with us. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. This is always a blast. You know, the podcasts are fun because they're just conversational. And thanks so much for your questions. They've been great. Find more from Hops and Spirits at hopspirits.com. Thanks, everybody. Bye.